I always liked school to start and um, had some ability to deal with math and science, which some of my uh, best friends didn't. So that sort of made me feel, well, maybe I have a little talent here. And um, my mother and father were big influences as well. Uh, my mother really wanted to be a biology teacher. And she used to tell me about her biology courses in college. But then she hit the, uh, the depression, and she had to go straight to work and not go on with any other education. So she didn't have the opportunity to develop that. So, but she instilled in myself and my sister uh, an interest in academics and science and biology. And um, I think that was a big influence. Um, Another important factor was both my mom and dad always told us to get into the game. That is, don't sit on the sidelines and, and watch it, but actually do the thing. So play tennis, and uh, when there's a play or a dance, get up there and be part of it. And I think that was very important for a career in, in science as well. Um, then there were particular teachers who were very influential. I had a particularly important teacher in elementary school who said, you know, you have a talent for things like science. Why don't you take a little extra course or come with me to this lecture or this um, museum? And um, I think that's important for children. You don't really know if you have a talent unless somebody says, well, you have something there. Why don't you develop it? So that was another important influence. In high school, I also remember a, a female chemistry teacher who I really admired. And um, so I used to work extra hard in that class. And she also took a, some interest in uh, another teacher, a physics teacher, who encouraged me to take um, the Westinghouse exams. That was a national competition for students in science. And I won a, an award in there. And so all of those were positive influences and uh, things that encouraged me to think about science. Um, my father actually was an insurance broker, and my mother a secretary. So there wasn't a tradition in the family. But they really did encourage us to, um, to follow some kind of career and to some dream and some profession. My sister now became an artist, so we did take very different pathways. But uh, I think those were important influences. When I went, when it was time to go to college, I looked at a number of different colleges and um, decided not to go to a science intensive school. Uh, and that was a very interesting story in a sense. The high school that I went to in uh, Brooklyn, New York, was a large one, Midwood High School. It was a public high school. It was a very excellent high school, which had a lot of uh, second generation students. And education was a very important uh, factor in the lives of families, because it was through education that you succeeded and actually were able to get out of Brooklyn. <laughs> When it came to looking for colleges, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I applied to a number, and one of them was Bennington College, a small women's college in Vermont. And when I went up there, I just fell in love with it. It was only 350 women, uh, so it was truly small. And it was experimental. Uh, there was a ph philosophy of learn by doing. So there were not a lot of lectures where you had like art appreciation or science um, lectures, but you had a lot of labs and uh, you did art, you, you did music, you uh, had a lot of laboratory experiences. And so Bennington was a, again a, a participatory school. It was each person should develop their own talents and really get out into the world and find out what you, what you like. I tended to go to the sciences there and had excellent teachers who were very encouraging. I think the idea of be being a woman in a woman's college was also very important to me. Um, in, in that, for me, 
I really like the idea of not having to worry what I looked like, what clothes I had on, or what I said in class, because it might affect whether I would go out or not with somebody. <laughs> Instead, we just focused on the, the topic at hand and plunged ourselves into different projects and things and grew uh, under that experience. So the college experience was important and confirmed that I really liked science. I, I liked getting into projects and I liked things like quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis particularly because they gave you unknown comment, uh, compounds and you had to figure out, it was problem solving, you had to figure out, well, what was this? So there was no book that you were following or protocol. You were challenged to, to find, to solve a problem and find a way. And again, it was a, a reaffirming experience. Now, I also loved Bennington because it wasn't all science. The strength of Bennington College was in the arts, in the theater and dance. And it, it allowed me to have an experience that I don't know that many college students have. That is, I participated in dance classes. I, I, I didn't do very much in art and theater, but I was with people who were doing art and theater. And I also learned how much how the similarities there are between artists and scientists in terms of developing an idea of looking at the world and trying to translate or find some truths or find the answers to, um, to a certain subject or a certain part of a subject. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. It, was, it changed my life and perspective in terms of how I saw the world and how I saw people getting into um, their own thing. Uh, so college was um, a very positive experience in terms of a fundamental uh, development in the sciences and, and subjects in general. And then um, I have to mention that there was one other course that I loved in college, <laughs> which was myth, ritual, and literature course. Uh, so for a scientist to have that experience was also great. Uh, we, we studied myths uh, of cultures around the world from uh, all different uh, times and found how similar people are in terms of um, the importance of, of birth, of puberty, of marriage, of uh, certain kinds of beliefs and certain kinds of interactions between people. And so again, it was a a broadening experience in terms of how you see the world. I wanted to come back uh, to the New York, New Jersey area, but I didn't want to actually live in my parents' home. I wanted to, I was independent now. <laughs> so I applied to a number of things and decided to go to Rutgers uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and that's where I did my PhD. Uh, it was a combined physiology and biochemistry department at that time, uh, just before the medical school was started there. Uh, and uh, there, there was um, a very good science, but not spectacular, but it was a very good place for an education, for learning experimental design and method. It was student-centered. There were a lot of good students there, uh, and uh, that's where I... Um, did my first experimental work. My PhD was with uh, Dr. John Bird, um, who was a physiological biochemist, and we studied uh, muscular dystrophy and uh, protein breakdown in an animal model at the time. Uh, it got me into the subject that I would pursue in the future, but I didn't know it at the time. And actually, my graduate school experience was such that I thought afterwards that this is really very frustrating business, that is research, that you have to work pretty hard, long hours, you didn't always get answers or things that you could interpret. And I thought by the end of that experience that maybe I shouldn't, maybe I've made a mistake, and maybe I should look for another career. And um, I also at that point met um, my husband, who was a fellow graduate student, and we um, we both um, decided. Well, we would. He he was into research and knew that's what he wanted, and I was questioned questioning this uh, long term career. Um, but we applied to uh, Vanderbilt for postdoctoral fellowships. 
he and both of us, um, he went to a research lab, and I went looking for a teaching job. I thought, well, maybe I'll try teaching in an elementary school, or uh, not in an elementary school, in a, in a college, a, a, a community college or a regular college. But I couldn't find a job, and partly it was because I didn't have any education experience, and they were looking for that kind of um, background. And while I was looking around, um, I found, uh, I met some of the people at Vanderbilt in biochemistry and physiology and other departments there. And um, Janie Park, who was uh, in the Department of Physiology at Vanderbilt, said, well, why don't you come on over and maybe we can find you some research experience. So it was a pretty informal uh, situation. Um, I ended up working with Janie Park, uh, postdoc, and it's there that I really decided that, yes, this was it. Uh, this was the right thing to do. This was the career for me, and that, that, I, that I loved it. <clears throat> that department was a very exciting one at the time. Um, for one thing, uh, Rollo Park uh, was the chair of the department, and uh, Earl Sutherland, who was a Nobel laureate, was in that department. He didn't have the Nobel Prize while I was there, but he had a very exciting laboratory. He uh, discovered cyclic AMP, and uh, at the time, cyclic AMP is a very important compound for hormonal um, responses. At the time, it wasn't believed, or it was quite controversial, but he had a very um, active group of people who were working on insulin and uh, a number of different hormonal responses. and. Um, it was a very exciting place to be. Um, John Exton was there at the time. Uh, he was either a postdoc or a young faculty member who was working with Rollo Park. Uh, so it's interesting that many years ago we met as associate editors of JVC. Um, but there were a lot of um, very dynamic, uh, research-oriented uh, people at Vanderbilt, and it was a very um, exciting time to be in research. One important thing that um, I did was read a book called Games Never, Games Your Mother Never Taught You. It's by Betty Harrigan. And it was uh, an important book because it taught me that women come into a profession with some very different sets of experience than men do. Part of that comes from the kinds of competition that men engage in often in football or basketball or team sports that, in my day anyway, women didn't do very much of that. Um, and there is a team spirit in a, in a college uh, or a university as well in which you have to know the, your place in the team. You, you don't do everything. You do some things very well. And in a department, there's sort of a coach who's the chair of your department, <laughs> and then there are the players. And all the players do their thing, but also interact with other people. And so there's a mentality that men are very comfortable with. Uh, and they also know sometimes they win and sometimes they lose, and they know how to get up and get going again. And that mentality was in this book, too, to, uh, sort of the idea that you will fail sometimes, but you have to learn how to deal with failure and get up and go again. Um, I know many women, including many of my students, feel very devastated if a paper is rejected or a grant is rejected. But this is part of mentality you have to develop. Uh, it's not those things that are rejected that counts. It's that you get up, go again. It's the things that are successful that count, that people will know you for, that will, you, you will succeed with. Uh, so the mentality of you're part of a competitive profession, you will lose, you will win, uh, you're part of a team, uh, are all important factors for how you deal in our profession. And, and I learned it at a very important part through this book. There are other books out there now, and I always encourage, encourage people to look at those. It could hit you as just right or how to see what your place is in when, um, if, you, if you take a look at these uh, perspectives. I started my lab at um, 
the Medical College of Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, using the experience that I had from graduate school and postdoctoral experience, and I started asking questions about protein turnover uh, and looking at specific enzymes on how they were degraded in animal cells in a diabetic uh, model. I, the questions that I was asking was, why do some proteins turn over so rapidly and, and others don't? Why is it in diabetes, which uh, the type 1 diabetes, the juvenile form of diabetes, is a wasting disease? Um, we know that there are, you lose sugar and lipids and proteins, but um, the questions I was asking was there are some proteins that remain stable and are essential that you preserve, and other proteins that are degraded uh, quite rapidly and uh, diminish away. How does the cell select that, and what are the regulation factors, and how do hormones affect protein degradation? Along the way, while I was studying these and fortunately got a, an NIH grant, NIH has been very important to my career uh, from that point on, um, but my first NIH grant, uh, somebody gave me a chance, a young faculty member, and started me off. But along the way, I found, uh, I discovered a, an enzyme uh, called meprin, M-E-P-R-I-N. It's a metalloproteinase that degrades proteins. And um, that discovery actually was through a collaboration and that has really been the main focus of my uh, career ever since. The way that came about was um, I went to some national and international meetings uh, talking about some of the initial work we were doing with protein degradation and met a colleague in England uh, called Rob Bainan. And Rob was a young, uh, who was a postdoc actually in uh, Liverpool. And we um, talked about our common interests, and he came over to my lab with a little NATO scholarship one summer and brought a assay, uh, a way of measuring specific pro protein de degrading enzymes. And we found this very high uh, activity in the kidney of mice. Um, we went to the literature to see what this was, and we couldn't find anything in the literature, so we went ahead and purified it and characterized it and named it meprin. And that's led to the next 25 years of my work. Uh, so it was through um, going out of the lab, talking to people, having somebody with a little bit of different materials and approaches uh, that led to, to that discovery. And there were innumerable experiences in my career in sciences in which the unanticipated or serendipitous types of things have led to a real advance. And I always encourage uh, students to take advantage of opportunities you have to get out of the lab from time to time, listen to some lectures that you don't think will really be relevant to you but you never know, and um, interact with people because that's where new ideas and new approaches come to come from and some very important discoveries and um, advances in your own research. An important uh, event in, uh, during my assistant professorship time was going on a sabbatical in England. Um, I chose uh, a lab uh, in Cambridge, England with Dr. Alan Barrett and it was a wonderful experience for my whole family, actually, I should say, because my husband had found a lab at uh, University of Cambridge. My son was six years old and um, went to an infant school there and developed a wonderful British accent, <laughs> learned to read in England. And um, I had a very positive experience uh, in uh, a lab called the Strange Ways Research Lab with Alan. Uh, it also widened my perspective on proteases because his, he was an international and, and still is an international expert on proteolytic enzymes and I met and heard uh, about a lot of uh, very important work on um, prote proteolytic enzymes and met a lot of people in the field. Uh, 
the paper that uh, Alan and I published was sent to the Journal of Biological Chemistry for, uh, submitted to the Journal of Biological Chemistry and was rejected, <laughs> um, which was bloody awful according to Alan. Uh, but we uh, recouped and sent it uh, off to Biochemical Journal and went on from there. But it, it gave me um, uh, sort of a start that here this um, very high quality work was not acceptable in the JVC and I learned that you really have to read the guidelines <laughs> of what um, uh, of what a journal is looking for and in this sense some of the work that I did uh, was based on other work from Allen's lab that had been published in the JVC and this was not considered enough of an advance or uh, enough of a difference from that, that um, it was published. Uh, but it set a high standard, and uh, I realized this, this was an important factor. The, the, the work was published, and it did get recognition, and uh, I went on from there. Um, the first paper that I did publish from the JBC was actually uh, from my graduate work with Janie Park. And uh, so I knew from it uh, that this was the place to publish uh, really important biochemically fundamental work. And I always looked up to it and um, realized that uh, it was some something to aspire to. Well, um, First of all, let me say that I had some wonderful experiences and students at the Medical College of Virginia, um, one of who is uh, Dr. Kenny Offerman, who is uh, now a professor at Emory, and she was um, one of my first uh, students. She was an MD, PhD student, and students played a very important part in my research experience uh, at, um, in Virginia. Um, in Virginia, I moved through the ranks from assistant professor to associate to professor over a 20-year period. And at that point, um, there were some inquiries as to would I be interested in doing more administration and um, uh, getting into uh, professorship type activities. I um, really hadn't thought very much about that, being involved in the lab and um, developing research ideas, working with students. But I decided to go ahead and look at a few uh, opportunities. And one of those was the chair of the Department of uh, Biochemistry. It was actually called Biochemistry and Nutrition at that point at Virginia Tech. Um, I must say that I had some reluctance in moving to Virginia Tech being originally brought up in New York City and thinking of uh, Blacksburg, Virginia as a very rural community, my husband had to tell me what were the names of the cows as we drove by. <laughs> but, um, and also the fact of a woman going into an agricultural college was, uh, as, a, as a chair was a sort of a pioneering experience. I remember my mother calling me when I did accept the job there uh, once a week to find out if I was really okay and if I <laughs> had adapted to this experience. Uh, and it was quite a, a new and different experience. But it was a growth experience. It was uh, the quality of students at Virginia Tech was terrific. Uh, again, it was we could hire a lot of people. It was a, it was a time when there was uh, investment into um, into the sciences and growth in biochemistry. So it was very positive. Um, it, my research program also flourished at Virginia Tech, and it was there that I got a merit award from the NIH, which again was a very confidence building and wonderful experience, and uh, also points out the importance of of the National Institutes of Health in our in fundamental research that it has been critical over uh, the, the, the past um, 40 years, really. Well, I've been at Penn State now for uh, the past 13 years, and um, the research has gone well. Um, the again, there's a wonderful student population there, and I've had um, excellent students along the way, which makes it really a joy. Not only do you see them grow, but they have bring in new ideas and new um, uh, 
ways of thinking about things. And uh, I think there's been an explosion of um, moving the, the work both into structural and functions of, of these proteases and into medical applications. At the time that um, I was publishing uh, and had some publications in, in JBC and this and that, I became aware that you can become a member of this society, and I wanted to become a member of uh, this society. It was my natural home. At that time, it was an honorific society and very difficult to get in. And I had heard all kinds of stories about people being nominated and rejected and through a lifetime because their work wasn't either of the quality or of the um, uh, had or of the impact that people w needed to have. Uh, so it was with great trepidation that I um, started talking to some of the people who were members to say, "Is it a possibility to become a member?" And um, then somebody nominated me, and I. Um, uh, I actually did was elected to the society uh, in the early 80s, I believe. And it was a, a great honor. And uh, so I've always ha held that up as a, an important step to become part of this community. Uh, I also sent my best papers to JBC <laughs> and uh, was always very happy when um, they were accepted and, and uh, uh, take great pride in that. First of all, there, there's a wonderful group of people to work with. Uh, the office staff is energetic and uh, very competent and um, initiates a lot of ideas and uh, works very well with the council and the volunteers. And um, the, we have in this particular year, uh, a special mission to, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the JBC and the ASBMB. So um, a lot of our efforts have been geared toward that celebration, recognizing the past and thinking about moving into the future. Uh, the other sort of activities that have been prominent are dealing with how we want our society to grow. We really are an international society. Uh, something like 80% of our members are American and 20% are international. But that's a growing percentage. And when you look at our journals, uh, 50 or so percent of our journals are um, papers from overseas, uh, not from the US of A. So um, this is a very important component. Uh, biochemistry and molecular biology is definitely an international enterprise, and our society uh, grows and uh, focuses on the international. So I think that will be an important um, aspect of our society. How do we want to grow? Uh, I have been fortunate enough to, to have contact with uh, a number of uh, groups outside of our um, national groups. Uh, so our interactions with the International Union of Biochemistry um, has been important, and they will join us at our meeting, um, our centennial meeting. Uh, we have interacted with the FEBS group, the Federation of European Biochemical Societies, and uh, they also have been supportive and want to work with us. I had a trip to China with a delegation from the ASBMB, and the, the Chinese um, biochemistry societies and universities are also now very anxious to uh, publish with us, uh, come to our meetings, collaborate, and, and grow in the, in the national international scene. And um, I also had a trip to Argentina where the Pan American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology had a meeting. And there are a lot of wonderful young people and um, excellent science that's going on in Latin America uh, close by us that we can work with and uh, grow in the future. So international aspects of um, the society and our profession are, are going to be important aspects and how we grow, how we interact has been one of the focuses. Um, another important uh, enterprise for us is the young people uh, because that's the future of our society. And we have an active group of um, 
scientists in our society who are trying to work with uh, young people in college and their, um, their teachers and to both guide and help teaching biochemistry, the foundations for biochemistry and molecular biology, and for introducing uh, young scientists to the national scene, to invite them to our meetings and to support them in, uh, oh, and uh, work with them to come to our graduate schools and, and colleges. So I think those are some of the aspects that uh, we have been working with. Um, Another important aspect of our society has been um, the political or public affairs aspects. As you know, our, there are certain challenges that we are facing in the funding of science. It's an expensive enterprise. There are lots of other expenses that are um, very, uh, that have grown significantly in the last year or two in our nation. And we want to ensure that there is a continuous funding stream to science, uh, both the education of young people and the um, continuation of uh, research to, to keep our position and keep our um, talented people uh, working and making advances. The science itself is so exciting these days with all we know about genomes and new technologies to, to capitalize on that. And the promise of all these things for cures of disease, that it's very important that we work hard to allow this enterprise to go strong and to encourage people to come into it so that um, we can uh, fulfill the promises. And biochemistry, as you know, is fundamental to all the life sciences, and it's, uh, it's position in working with both the applied medical sciences and the other basic sciences is very critical to a strong uh, uh, medical or biomedical enterprise. So we're, um, there's a lot to do, and there's, there's a lot of people who want to see us grow and um, flourish in our society. So I think the society can play an important role in that.